So now uh, we will see about UDM. Okay? So how to extend the and how uh, we can use UDM. So UDM stands for user defined functions. Uh, these are separate functions uh, which you can write, which can be invoked inside of it. Okay? So why we need UDM? Uh, this is basically to say that you know there are certain operations. There are certain operations which you might want to do, uh, which is not on one field. You might want to do it on multiple fields, right? Let's say that's one one typical example would be um, you might probably want to let's say that there is a for you have a data about an employee, right? And then you have the start date and then the end date or a contract, right? and you want to find out all people who worked less for less than 30 days. So how do you find it? So you can't filter it out using rhythm function. So in that case, what you have to do is to take both of these and you need to compute something. So that process of computing can be offloaded uh, to, to the UDM. That is, so scenarios like that where you might have to operate on more than one thing. So that is one thing, one place where you might have to use UDM. The other thing is you want to do more than uh, filtering and grouping. So this custom filter which I talked about where you have multiple dates and then Based on the date, you need to find out some operation or uh, things simple, like simple cap, right? Uh, make all the letters capital. Yeah, that is also something which you might want to do. Uh, and things like string manipulations, or you know, you want to find out talent or some kind of string manipulations, those kind of things. Or you want to strip some characters to be from 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 the beginning and end of the column. So those kind of scenarios you might probably want to use the UDM. And the other reason is uh, if you already have a legacy Hadoop system and uh, like already the business logic is already there, maybe in Hadoop system or maybe in your enterprise software, whatever, and you want to reuse that. So there's no point, if you already have something and there's no point, provided it is modular, there's no point in reinventing it again and again. Right? You might want to probably reuse it. The other reason is uh, programmers are generally comfortable because you might probably would have used Java for the last five years. You might probably be more comfortable in that too. And probably more okay. Uh, so traditionally, before uh, Hadoop, uh, sorry, before Quick release 0 0.8, the current version is 0 0.11. So before that, uh, people were, uh, I mean, you can create UDF only in Java. Okay. But now, uh, you can actually use languages like Python uh, and other languages as well. I mean, I think in 0 0.8 Python support was added, and in uh, 0 0.10 I guess uh, the support for dynamic languages were added. So you can do Ruby, JavaScript, and other things. So basically, the when you say dynamic uh, languages, as in you know, the Java versions of Python have those languages. So, for example, Python is Python. Hmm. So means J yeah. Yeah. yeah, those things. Those things which can run into JD. And there is also something about streaming by which you don't need things to be in JD. Just that it's some executable which can read from STD and write to STD. But it's also Starting with me, shocking. Okay, so there are multiple types of uh, UDF which you can write. One is an eval function. I'll tell you what is an eval. Then you have filter functions, then you have load functions and store functions. And things. Okay. So what is eval function? Eval function is something where you want to take some input and give an output from it. The input could be anything. It could, it could be a tuple, it could be a single field, it could be an integer, or it could be whatever, any data type. And then output could also be the same. It could be a scalar type like a string integer whatever, or it could be a tuple or it could be a path. You could take something and you can uh, I mean, you can basically um, return something. Okay, that is eval. And filter functions is a special case of eval where it is going to return a boolean. So if it returns a boolean, then you can use that in the filter clause or in a in a comparison operator, um, and then you can use it for filtering. And load and store functions are basically used uh, in cases where you are loading. Uh, <coughs> We will see about the uh, eval functions. So, eval functions are generally used in the for each, right? So, for each, you use a generate 
and then in the generate you may want to pass in a field or the entire up to the things like that and then you want to so in the generate you want to use something else to and this is the most common type of thing. Pretty much most of the UDF which are written are written for English. So can okay. you use a, a specific language inline for this for this UDFs? Earlier you mentioned that there is an inline mechanism available. So can I embed but inline, say JavaScript or Python code directly here for the value? Okay. So when I said inline, I meant embedding the code inside Java. That is like one thing. That is one thing. The other thing is streaming. Streaming is where you is invoke an ex executable and then pass it. The third is UDF. These are three different so things. UDF I cannot embed say JavaScript. Uh, you can write UDF in JavaScript and call it, but not embed. Not embed. It will not understand. Right? I mean, embedding only works if you are streaming something. So if you have an executable, you can execute it and then that can invoke a STD and then that can read from STD and then write in STD. I think it's basically using big storage kind of thing, right? Using that screen on it. This executable thing that you're talking about, but how executables are invoked with the big. So they can be used, in, they can be used like similar to uh, any other, they can be used for a particular field, they can be used on a particular relationship, they can be used during load time. Or during eval time, or even oh, you don't have to say you don't have to use any of That that applies to this executable as well. Oh, and uh, yeah, so they they can return simple types or tuples. Okay. And uh, so this is how you generally use it. So you say for each a whatever relationship generate. Uh, so this is your package dot your function. And then what do you want to pass? You can pass a single parameter, you can pass multiple parameters, or you can pass in a couple. In this relationship itself you can pass. That becomes a couple. So let's see. Uh, one thing. Uh, if I want to reference the entire row, mm -hmm. the entire couple, mm -hmm. how do I reference it inside a, after this generator? This code is there. Yeah. Where you want to so if I want to reference the entire couple in function, hmm. we just pass in A. Yeah. Just pass in A then. Okay. 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 Create a UDF function. Okay, this is specific to Java, which I'm talking about. Okay, and so what happens is like pig provides a function, uh, an interface called eval func, which is a interface which is available as part of the pig jar. Okay, so this is a generic interface, which means that you need to specify the type. So the type here is the return type. So your UDF is going to return something back, right? Whether it is going to return a string or an integer or a tuple or a bag or whatever, that will go here. Okay, and then uh, input come input always comes as a tuple. You should remember this. Uh, even though you are going to pass only one, so in the previous thing, right, we passed only one uh, column here. Even though you have pass one column or you are passing two columns, all of that is put into a tuple, and then you will be getting. The input as a tuple. So you need to do your custom validation there. Find out whether the tuple is passed properly and check for empties, nulls, and all that. That you have to do. And then there is a function called exec, okay, which you should extend. That is in the interface. And that function should return the actual value which you wanted to return to the pixel. Okay. And uh, so these two are optional. There is also there are two functions. One is called get r to func mapping. This is a really funny name. Uh, so what what it is used is to map uh, the input types to the variables. So the input I said is always a tuple, right? The, but the tuple should follow uh, some pattern. So it should be like the first is string, second is integer, some some ordering in that tuple, right? If you want to maintain that, then you need to extend this function. 
And the same thing when you are writing something back, if you're just instead of writing a scalar value, you're writing a tuple or a bag or something like that, right? Then PIP should know what type you're returning. For that, you should extend this function. These two are optional if you're just going to take one string variable and then return a string variable. But if you're doing, uh, if you if you're going to accept a tuple, then you need to extend this. If you're going to return a tuple or a bag, then you should. But you can say that you know, all this when it is tuple because you, know, you can have one argument or whatever. Yeah, you are, it's always a tuple. But what is the structure of a tuple? Whether it has three columns, one first is a string, second is an int, and third is an int or something. That structure, if you need to if you need to if you need to give it to the UDF, then you need to. So we may be writing some Java code uh, to do this. So the other thing is uh, after you do this. How do you invoke the UDF in okay. So after you create the UDF classes, you need to create a jar file and then package um, all your the, the classes to a jar file and then register and then put the class put the jar file in the class path and then register the jar at the top of the screen. There is a function called register which will take the path of the jar and then you just need to call that. That is like input, right? So you just need to do that. Or that is like the hash include which we used to do in C. Just define. And then uh, if that jar, if your UDF is going to depend on some other jar files, let's say you are using the Apache Common Stream library or something like that, right? Then you need to include those libraries as well. And you can register those jars as well. Okay? And then you have to define your UDF function. This is like a function declaration which you should do at all. And then you can use your UDF. So I have a small code uh, which we which we can see. So let's um, so this is a UDF function which I wrote. The reason why we're going to use this function is if you actually look at the tweets, right? So I told you that this has quotes in it, right? So I want to extract only the text of the tweet. Yeah. <coughs> but then you will find that it has to close. So let's write a UDF function which will strip that. Back on the big schema down the line, then it will be easy for you to be working. 
technically you don't need to do it, but it's a good practice to do this for this man. So, uh, so this is the E function is going to get the tuple input. Okay, so we are getting uh, input as a tuple. So as I said, it's up to us to to check if the input is null or if there is an empty or if the size is proper and all those things. Okay, so we should do that as a condition. And then, uh, so I'm converting the string to the input or get. So this first, this is a tuple, right? So there's only one one. So first thing which I'm getting, I'm converting that to string, and I'm passing it to this. So this is basically the Apache Commons string library. So basically, I'm going to strip whatever character which I give from the front end, end of the end, end of the string. So this character, this code's character, I'm just going to strip it out from the and uh, so what you need to do is you need to catch all exceptions. So you may not. So class cast exception is is not mandatory to catch, right? But you still have to ca catch it here. Okay. Uh, and you should always make sure that you don't throw any exception to the Because if you throw any exception to the you your big uh, might fail. So uh, make sure you catch all your exception and when you throw something back, right? So there is another slide where I'll tell you what is the logic you need to follow uh, for error handling in in the okay, video. For now, remember that you need to catch you need to catch all your exceptions. Okay, for exception we said so you are saying that you should only throw IO exception. So, you know, the contract seems to be that you know convert any exceptions into IO exceptions, right? Uh, not just that, so there is a reason why we have to wait to an IOS. And we will talk about the error handling here. Uh, but remember that you need to catch all the exceptions. Here, even if I remove this, right, try the catch and all that, I am not going to get an exception. I am not going to get an error because I don't need to, in Java, I don't need to catch the class as an Yeah. Right, but we still are doing it. That's the and so basically you are saying we should catch all checked as well as unchecked exactly. exactly. Okay. So uh, that is a exec function and then uh, this get r to fun uh, function mapping function right. So uh, what we are going to get is just one. Uh, so inside the tuple we are going to get only one string, right? So we define a new schema and then. The and then we are adding a field schema to it, and then we are saying that that would be of type character, right? which is a which is string. Okay. And then uh, this is boilerplate code which you have to write. It basically uh, creates a function specific uh, list based on this array. So this is Java. So you can't expect anything better. I have a lot of these boilerplate code. Okay. So once you do this. What you need to do is you need to create a jar with this file. Okay, so if you're using Eclipse, you can just right click and right click and then create a jar. Or if you're using, if you're not using Eclipse, then you have to just use Java C and then create a jar. It's Java C and then Java C. You can, or you can use an Ant build script, you can make some some script to create a jar. Okay, so if you look at my folder structure, what I have done. Is that I have uh, the UDF with this project inside this directory, okay? And then I have created I have created the jar in the list directory. Okay. So from my create pixel directory, it is inside the UDF. Okay. So then I also have. This is the UDF, uh, so this is a big script where we can call that UDF. What is, what is that in the first line? Sorry, that line is not absolutely in the script. Register, right? Yes, sir. So, we have to manually write that this is the same thing or we have to write that this No. Manually, we have to write it. Because it doesn't know which. Yeah, I mean, so the big script doesn't know which uh, jar you are writing. So, why are we also adding the common line? Common line. 
because I'm inside this uh, here I'm using that, right? So this project also depends on this UDF jar itself contains this common angle. No. The UDF the jar will not contain anything. It will just be in the So I just put that in the lift directory so that uh, egg lift doesn't contain. But when I created the jar, only the UDF class is there inside. So uh, we need to call the register function. The register function just takes the jar, the path through the jar, related path to the jar, and then you just uh, register it. After that, we need to register the jar. <coughs> After we register the jar, uh, we have to use something called the define function. Okay? So this define function is somewhat similar to um, import. Right? So you define the import so that you don't have to use a full package name and call the function in Java. More or less similar. Okay, so you just define what is the function you're going to call, and what the full package will have, and then the class. Okay, and then uh, what we do, we just reload the file here. This is a normal stuff which we used to do. If you don't define it, you can directly call it there also. Uh, also we can call it. You can call, but so sometimes people complain. It's better to better to define, so better to define it. So this, there are some weird combinations for which it will not take. Okay. And uh, yeah, so here is what we are calling. So we are using for each, generate, and then the script is the, is the UDF, okay? And then we are passing in this eighth parameter for this. So if you actually look at the data file, so if you actually look in the data file, right? So this will be in the eighth column. One, two, Eight is the best. Okay, so we do And then uh, so for each data we we are calling this function and then getting the tweets. Okay. And then we jump this from the tweets. So let's execute it. Uh, so that where did you get this particular data from? Did you get it from somewhere? By contacting Using the Twitter API to get No, uh, Twitter provides a way by which you can export all your tweets. These are my tweets. So this are yours? Yeah. So if you go to Twitter settings, they uh, you can request an archive of all your tweets. And then they give it to you in CSV form. Alternatively, you could register an application and then just connect it and get it. Yeah, yeah but like you can search only, for any tweet or whatever. No, but the problem is this, right? So Twitter API uh, gives you you can only query the last uh, X number of there's some limit. You can only go up till 20 page. There's some limit. Part there is your own tweets you can do. Even right? if it's your own tweets. Okay. You can API, you can query all of them. Okay. This is like a dumb which basically gives you all your all your, all your tweets. So I need to what, pay special money to use the Twitter API to get a, all the tweets? No, they have Like let's say I have an application that I'm selling some services to someone. No, they have a hard limit. So they recently changed a lot of <coughs> API terms. They're not allowed to take a, a firehose from Twitter. They don't give you a firehose. They I pay a million so dollars, they still wouldn't. I mean I can buy you can pay a million dollars. You need to become a partner with Twitter. They only give it to like four partners now. Yeah. So you can get the firehose data. Firehose data is like you get a real time each of all. So you get used to like, I don't know, like, so you get the real time tweets of uh, of all the people. All the Twitter sells them, yeah, Twitter sells that data. But you need to, it's not that you can, being an API that will be generated, you need to be a partner, you need to sign a deal. And it runs into millions, millions of dollars. Or three years ago. Some, some huge amount of Weird number they got. But we can get our own data, isn't it? Yeah. Our tweets we can get. Our tweets we can get as an indicator. No, not not through API. So that's when like people really complain, saying that I need my own data. That's when they that's when they said okay, we will give you a dump so of an interface where you can archive and get the said they said okay, we will give you the archive. Make sense. 
to allow the person to have access. Right? So, for example, if you have a restaurant right, and you are trying to mine the tweets, then doing some semantic analysis to find the normal perception. Right? So, you kind of need an API. Right? It would be better to have an API to get that. And we have some. They recently changed. They recently picked up a lot of them. So it has given us uh, the tweets and yeah there are no posts. So you can so just you have some to Okay. Um, so any questions on on the UDF or be over So uh, most question that happens to see the jar uh, mm -hmm. he showed us but I'm not sure about it. Uh, this jar fill that we generate uh, as part of our this project. It needs to be at what directory level. It can be at any directory level. <coughs> you just need to be at the big script, you know, where does it need to be? It can be at any any. It can be anywhere. So it can be anywhere. You just need to do the path here. Oh. Okay. So I showed you that I have put it in this relative directory, so I'm putting this relative directory. Uh -huh. uh -huh. You can give a relative path, you can give an absolute path. Anything is fine. Okay. And P doesn't care where it is. Just that you need to know where it is. And then, uh, if you are doing, um, you know, on, a, on the Hadoop mode, on the cluster mode, <coughs> people generally do, what they do is they put the jar in the HDMS rather than in the local. That improves because that, this can be put in the HDFS cache and put across all nodes in the those So people generally put it in HDMS. Any questions on on pick? Uh, sorry, the UDF or how we wrote the UDF? So if you have a JavaScript uh, based in you know, UDF, how do you do that? Inside it's completely different. Sorry. It's completely different. It has a similar uh, registration. Uh, what is this below part of it on the list form spec? Okay. So this basically. And does it automatically get generated or should no, we? No, no, we should write. So what I mean, pretty much most of the UDF is about, I just copy this seriously. So uh, what it actually does is, this. so you give, uh, I mean, so you, from your, uh, you, from your, uh, you're going to give some data, right? Some data type. But uh, what Pig does is that Pig is Pig is going to enclose that in a tuple and then send it to UDF. Okay. In your UDF, you know how to. Uh, distinguish it. So you basically say uh, split it up and do this. But uh, internally, so this is this implementation is running. There is some engine which is running this implementation, right? That implementation needs to know uh, what is the data type, so that it can better optimize it. So for that, you need to tell uh, the engine what is the mapping between uh, the tuple and the actual value, or you basically need to define the schema. Of that input which you are getting. So that's what you're doing here. So you're basically creating a schema, empty schema, and then you're right, you're adding to that a field schema. This is a parent schema, and then you're writing a field schema, and then the field schema is of type character array. Okay. Okay. And then uh, you basically have to return the schema in this function, but this expects it to be a list of function spec. Okay. Function spec is a class. And then you need to return the list of it. So what do you do? You take arrays dot as list is basically going to take an array, and then convert that into a list. Array, okay. basically this list. Okay. And then you create a function spec because you have only one fun one function spec here because you have only one input. And then you pass in. So you basically create a new function spec using the schema which you created. So you created a schema. That schema had a field schema. So you created a schema with one field schema. You have a schema object. Using that schema object, you need to create a function spec. 
you created that function schedule. So for that constructor you are passing uh, the scheme, the schema which you have created. Okay. You need to also give a name to it. The name is not used anywhere, but you need to give a name. To it. Uh, some if you go to the explain in the big script that I mean, basically if you go to the execution engine you can find out what is the schema name. Okay. So for that you need to know the you need to name name it. So since you uniquely name it. The Java's way of unique naming is this dot class name dot get name, which basically gives you the current class. Okay. So this is so if you take function spec, that takes two parameters. One is a string name and the schema. Okay. So that's what you've given here. You created one. This is specifically for big data. Specifically for UDF. UDF. Yes. Okay. And who calls this particular uh, the big the big engine? Sure, big engine which is which is doing this to be a front. Okay. So and then what you do, you create this function scale. Okay. It's a single object. Okay. But you need a list. Okay. You need to convert that. List. So you convert that uh, as a list using this. And then you would run that. So even your UDF will be converted into a MapReduce class. Uh, no. UDF will not be converted to a MapReduce class. Yes. UDF will be used as a uh, so from every map reduce so this jar will be pushed to all the machines all the nodes and in that node that map reduce job will copy okay. this will be like a jar uh, let's say I, I have another UDF in which say I have a name and I am splitting it into first name and name so in that case, how will this okay. So in that case, you basically are going to return that top. Okay. Right? We'll, we'll see that. So the next example. So this example is where we take a string and then return a string. Next example, you will take a string and you return a top. Okay. So before that, any, any questions, clarifications, we will move on to the next one. We saw an example where we were giving take the string and return the string. We will return a tuple. Okay. For this tuple, what we are going to do uh, is um, so the same with tweets. <coughs> so when you add reply somebody, when you reply to somebody in tweet, uh, in, in Twitter, what happens? You have the person's name on on that on that uh, string, right? So now let's find out. To who are the people I have replied so far in the entire Twitter array. Okay. So for that what we need to do, we need to find out uh, first whether that particular tweet has any uh, at or not. If there is an at, then we need to find out how many are there. So we don't know how many will be there. There could be zero, there could be one, there could be two. That's why we are doing a tuple. We don't know, I mean, otherwise you could return an array or something, but we don't know what, how many are going to be there, that's why you're going to return a tuple. Okay. So, uh, Java being Java, there is a tree for everything. So let me show you. So this is the email function, the same email uh, interface which you can implement or extend. And then uh, you have to specify the instead of the generic, you have to specify the return type. So return type I'm going to return a data back. Okay. And uh, this is the function, this is the UDF name. Right? And this is the same EXCC function like before, but here I'm going to return a data back. So the, top, the input is going to be a tuple. So the same um, checks which have to do whether it's a null, empty, and if the first thing is a null. So all these conditions are. And after that, <coughs> so let's first find the actual logic of splitting it up, then we will see how the data is happening. So I'm going to ignore this one for now. Um, so here what I do, I am using the build and seek of this in Java. So that is basically going to take a string and then it will uh, give me take, take a string, it will take the delimiter and then it will give me the list of tokens which I can iterate. 
standard JavaScript. So I iterate through all the elements here. Okay, I take the current token and I call this function, which basically sees if there is an at on that text on, on that word. I take each word and then I see if that word con word contains at. This is not the real logic. I should have seen whether it is there in the beginning. I realized it. Yeah, I should see whether it starts because I realized it because there was an email address which I wanted to So, and then if it is there, then uh, I have to use that. Okay. So, for that, so we, we basically have uh, two factories. One is called the back factory, and the other one is called a tuple. So, to return a tuple, I can't just return a tuple. So I need to put it in a bag and then return it. Okay. So uh, this will consider the outer bag and then a tuple for every username which I found. So every tuple will have only one column. Yeah, every tuple will have only one column. So Can I have multiple columns inside it? You can. Now, so for that, I need to create, uh, so these are just factories, the default uh, implementation for back factory and double factory, I just create some instances. And then this is how I create a new data pack. Okay, so I create a new data pack of the input and then I say, okay, uh, that factory dot new default data pack. Okay. And, and then what I do here, if that particular word is a Twitter username, then I add it to the output. So this is a bag.add, and then I have to create a new tuple. To the new tuple, I pass a string. So this, uh, this is one tuple, this is a tuple with one string inside. So you create that tuple, and then add it to the data pack. So this, as long as any, any number of uh, words match, that will add. If there is nothing which is going to match, then there will be a empty data pack. Then I return it. So it, it, it will be returned to the email. But there are two things, two things which you have to keep in mind. One interesting thing is whenever I touch it, it is something happens. So we have <coughs> these two uh, functions. So this function basically maps the input arguments. Right? Same thing. So we create a schema. We create a field schema of that particular string, so we're getting only one string there, and then the same code. This is the same code which we had in the earlier function. And this is the output schema. Uh, so output schema is used to map the tuple which we are giving out. So what we are giving out, we are giving out a bag with a tuple inside. Right? So that's what we are creating here. So we are creating an external schema, and then the external schema has a field schema which is a which is which is which is a character, right? Eh? And then it gets added here. So we create a schema which can take a field schema of this. So there are two schemas which get created, two or three. Yeah, two two schemas which get created. The field of a field, right? You get this idea, right? So it's basically a data bag containing a tuple with one string. So you have written this basically uh, you are returning a bag only, right? Yeah. So why are we complicating that schema so much? Okay, so uh, one thing is when you design that entire logic because, because um, they were thinking of having a very fixed schema earlier days. So the, the legacy of code state. Right? Because otherwise you could just say you know, this return a bag. But that was the, the second reason is, let's say uh, if you are debugging something, right, and you want to see what is the structure of this uh, relationship, that relationship then needs to have a very fixed system. So you need to let me know what is the data which is going on. So that implementation can count as That's why you, we are writing this very complex just, uh, just to say that we are just returning a pattern. So they have I've started out saying that you know, there is a schema, there is a field schema. So you create a field schema, define a type for it, and add it to a schema. And 
return a function, then create another class called function type. Okay. And then return a list of that. So it became so really because easy. currently now we are only on the function function spec we already have bad that's about it. Okay. Yes. But that bad what is the definition of it? Okay. Bad as a package. Okay. So that for that you need to create a fee scheme. Okay. And inside that is another scheme. For which we should also have okay. so first schema is a bad, and the bad we have a tuple, one side a tuple, we have a same the stigma. So that, that's why it's like and one other reason which I which I personally hate about Java, about uh, Java is that you know you end up creating a lot of these boiler plate things. Suddenly, if someone overrides Java code, right? Everything becomes becomes an object. They create factories and objects, and the the design pattern gets used extensively. In some places it makes sense, but there are other places where it like really complicates something which is very simple. That's my personal opinion. Alright, so this is the big script which we have. So the same thing. So we are registering those two uh, jars. I mean technically if this jar is not here, we are not using it. And yeah, oh, sorry, we, we need it because we are using this both the UDF and so we are defining both the UDF and then what we are doing, we are taking the wheat, stripping the codes of it and then passing it to this get return name function which will return as the names. Okay? So and then we are dumping it back. Yes. This should give us a list of all the different names. So this is empty. <coughs> these are empty. And uh, these are the names of the person. Yeah, he is my cousin. So I think we're going to get Yeah, I don't know. Something I think we should check the tweet. <laughs> These, these, this is sorted, right? So maybe this is the early days of Twitter. So for me, early days of Twitter. So we can also uh, print the tweet as well as this, so we can have a better understanding of what we do. Anyways, why are we getting nulls? So nulls because in the UDF we will be returning nulls. Null, okay. So we are not limiting that. We are not filtering that. We are not filtering. We can just add one filter yeah. and another, maybe we can also add a group by. Okay. To find out who's who's a person who I have tweeted about that weekend. So, uh, any questions on the pick script or the UDF? Uh, would you be able to share this code? Yes, I'm sharing this. So, I'll put it in the GitHub function. The UDF. I mean, including the data set. Before, uh, uh, just after the end of the thing, you can copy it, you can just copy it, you can do that, or I'll immediately put in the model. So I'll put it in, put it in a proper um, directory structure also, so you can just keep executing it, you don't even have to change the part. So it's in the end. And you need to pick jar, not it is without the uh, other part of the jar. So that is one thing, it was doing something. So you have the uh, the low level examples on some of the things that we are doing like we are going from uh, for each of something but then distinct by descending or by you know do you have multiple such uh, pick scripts that you have? So what I did is for all the pick scripts you showed me I have to something for that I will be, be sharing with you and maybe if you need very specific examples of things which you need to because he asked me about uh, doing a couple lookup, right? That is something I have to So those things he asked me about delimiting using multiple data. So like that if you have any specific request, let me know I will get some something to But whatever I have shown today I will share with you. Right. Okay. So
So, any any questions on this series? Is it like pretty over the board or is it? Uh, this one after lunch was a little over. I did it. Okay, good. So the thing is, like, I made this uh, UDF. I selected this because I wanted to do something which is as minimum as possible. But at the same time, it's not trivial, but shows the functionality. So this is the, uh, the lowest I could get. The lowest, simplest example, but at the same time, it's a complete example. There's no point just returning one or two. One, one question, you know, you, you seem to change a lot. Get, get R to funk mapping events almost the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as I said, you probably copy it over every time you write code. But the other one, exec, is that can overload it uh, function where you could return whatever you want and it will match something? You know, if you look at the function definition for exec, uh, the return arg is what? I mean, return arg <coughs> variable is what? Uh, in this case, it's data yeah. back. Exec, you know, yeah, that said you are overwriting some base function from some other class, right? So, no, no. So, this is a. So, this is a. Oh, abstract okay. Class. They would start okay. class. Abstract class. Okay. And this is an abstract method. Data bag is how many? Not not data bag. Data. It's it's a data. Okay. So this is using generate, right? So this oh, that's a template kind of thing. Is a template. template. Yeah, template. 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 So it, since it's a generate, so this is map. So you can actually go to the definition of this class and see. So this is a generate, and the return type of the exec function is all, is mapped to the same gen. Sure. So you have to, so the, since it's an abstract class and it's an abstract method, you have to implement it there. Implement it. I, I, for, uh, I think this was the part where I had lunch. I was thinking data bag and I didn't even recognize the fact that whatever you have in the template in data bag is the one that you return. So that's how it's really so was More looking at tuple that I wasn't actually following the other parts. So sorry about that. So as you said, tuple is always able for exact. That definition doesn't change. What changes is the return? What changes is the return? And you could pass in multiple parameters also from your from your UDF. UDF, but that all will be coming in as a can, can you go down a little bit to the uh, to the other functions that you have already uh, get? So uh, output schema, for example, right? If that that definition doesn't change any time. It will right? change based on what you are returning. Oh, got it. So that's where it is. Here I'm returning a data bag which contains a couple. Yeah, a data bag which contains a couple which contains a string. And you need to indicate that here. I've also given a name to the string, right? So that when you do a describe there or there, it will be pink. Right. So I'm going to get this part. The bag is still going to be pink. Yeah, but so subsequent like line, 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 line is not uh, uh, so last one. So this is fast. There's a lot of reflection utility that's going on here. You reflect on the class and then you yeah. So I mean basically what Is there a reason? What is it? What is it? Separate JV? 
just to be the same. Yeah. Is there a reason why you would want to execute? No, no, the only time it goes out of process is when Ex we talked about the exact thing, like for the, the external uh, streaming. Streaming, where you do HD in, HD out. You okay. are basically going in to a RPC mode, that's when it goes out. Well, Otherwise, it's in the. I think it will be the same. <coughs> I think he had a beautiful slide of eval, UDF's use for, eval is used for, all that. Pretty much all of, all of that. We use a lot of UDF in the context of 5. I mean, these functions are pretty expensive. I mean, in terms of, they think they call, you know, an iterative manner, right? So it doesn't make sense for it to go out of process, to be actually the process. But, um, so then one, one question is when you are, uh, in your uh, fixed script, when you're looking at a lot of rows, right, across the rows, the tuple that you're expecting here, is it uh, fair to say that you're getting one line, uh, one row? Uh, what I'm saying is this, this entire data set that you're looking at, uh, and you're passing something into the UDF function. Uh, does that mean that the entire data that represents that variable is sent to the UDF uh, in one go, like collected and sent, or is it given in some format? Like, uh, uh, I would think that it goes in one go. But because you define it as a, sorry. Yeah, because you, it has to be massaged to the top of the function. I think it will be sent in one go. I don't think it will be sent in one go. But I may be wrong. Right. Is there a way you can debug that by putting in some SD out messages here. Would you see it in the log file that you have that gets created? It never comes out. Is it? So if you dump one, you know, just break out some string, you know, you, would, you can't print. There is a there is another way by which you you can write the standard error or something, right? Standard error, or standard out. Some no, there are there are some functions. Here. I see that there are some logging functions that were being called from this, you know, whatever. Yeah, so you need to do that. You can't do like std.out. That will work. Any such thing that you print out would then show up on your app to use. I don't think it also comes in. Where would it come? In the context of when you run your big script, which is in a different client, and you have your Hadoop cluster is running, and this entire thing gets bunched and sent over Cluster, like you say, register, right? What that basically does is it over it to be. So, uh, I think, uh, I mean, we will also talk about error handling and logging. Okay. So that, that would come to the big front end or the big view or the Okay. But, uh, whatever you're going to print here, I don't think we come to the big. The most probably, I think, might come here in the Hadoop cluster. The Hadoop cluster. The job record log, right? I mean, the job record log. So let's move on to the next type of functions. We'll talk about future functions. So we talked about eval function, right? So eval function, what it was doing, it was um, taking any input, right? it was giving any output, right? Yeah, one, one. So I mean, what I mean by any is like any data type, and then can return any data. What future functions will do is it will take any data type. Like but it will return a boolean. Okay. And these can be used in the filter statement. Okay. And so the way you basically would uh, print it out is something like this. So filter data by the UDF name and then you pass in some data. Okay. So this data would appear as a tuple. You are packed a tuple and you can return a boolean. And then that boolean will be used for this filter. Okay. So uh, one important thing to remember is <coughs> the eval function and filter function, the implementation which happens in the UDF. For eval function, we were extending something called eval function, right? So there is a concrete implementation of it for filter where the return type is hardware. That we will be using for filter function. You got that, right? So, so for eval, we are using a generator. Correct. <coughs> the kind of generator. Yeah. So, so this guy, is, this is generator. So this is the generator which we have. But this is the abstract mm -hmm. Okay. But for filter functions, what happens?
instance, we will be using something called filter fund. Okay. If you actually get into the definition of filter fund, it internally would be uh, uh, it, it internally would implement the eval fund for boolean. So here the eval fund for boolean. Yes. Okay. So here this is the more generic, more abstract. But uh, filter fund is a concrete implementation of eval. Okay. And the return type is hardcoded as boolean. Okay. So uh, apart from that, pretty much all the other things are same for filter function. So you, you have to use uh, filter func, which is which is a eval func boolean. Right? So you have the implementation of it, and it should return a boolean. And input is same as eval func. So whatever same way, whatever logic we have to use, we should also check for the empties and nulls in the input. The same logic whatever we are using. And the same thing, the x, x, get r to func mapping should also be done in the same way. But here we don't need the output schema mapping because the output schema mapping is already done by the filter. Okay, so it's a boolean analysis. Yes. So you can actually look into the source code of this and then you can find out how they have defined the output schema. We could do that. So for this, for this, what we will do? Um, so I told you we have this uh, field CSV fund, right? So there are a lot of fields in there. So there is one field which ba which basically is going to say what is the client you used to um, tweet. Okay. So I have used multiple clients. I have also used my Vim uh, editor to send uh, tweets. Okay. So what we will do? We will find out all tweets. Which I tweeted from the from VM. So that's what this uh, UDF is going to do. So <coughs> so we just need to extend this, okay? And we have the EXCC function. In the EXCC function, we'll get the input, right? Uh, so we are going to get the first input of it and uh, if it is not null then we try to see if it contains the word treatment. So this is the add-on which I use. Okay, so let's see if it is What is this name supposed to be here? This is the VI. So here you can see, right? So you see directly from the menu you add that is yeah. I read from I pretty much do everything from So this is the source key. Yeah, so this is the source key. Here I read that from my phone. Right, so for this, I mean for something uh, <coughs> These are tweets which I get. So this will be, this is how the uh, source column will be created. Okay. So instead of passing the URL, I'm just checking if that contains that word, then we know that this is, I tweeted that from using that line. Okay. So here, uh, so that's what I'm doing. So I'm trying to see if it contains that. If it contains, then I'm, I'm returning true. And I'm returning false. Okay. So you might wonder that I told you that we should also check for nulls and IT and all that, right? I'm not doing it. The reason is earlier, if it was null, we were returning null. But here we can't return. We should either return two or four. So, and but I've surrounded, uh, but I've surrounded it with try catch. Okay, so if there are any error, then it will go and execute. So that exception would take you. So big would take in um, and ignore that particular so that filter function would anyway be fine, so we don't need that. And this is the same here. So get fun get R to fun mapping funny function is the same here. There's nothing changed because we're gonna just take one string into the unit. We're not taking it to just take it. So there's no change. So 
So this is for the argument, but when we are passing the tuple back, should we also do the same thing with the tuple which are passing back? Yeah, that, that's what we did in the output scheme. Output scheme. Okay. So here, right, let me turn in. So this is for the input. Input, okay. And this is for the output. Okay. So the input requires this list functions, right, and output requires a scheme. Okay, so okay. This is the output scheme. But here we don't we, we don't need to give uh, output schema because that would be done by the okay. um, So the script the, the big script for this so we register the jobs okay. and uh, we are using this report so we we are defining the two UDF which will Okay. And then we will be loading the data. <coughs> so here, yeah. So what I'm doing is filtering it by using so script code. This would give me the source, source text, whatever is specific source on here. So that I am stripping the code, and then I'm passing to the to the UDF function. So the UDF function will return either true or false. And so based on that, I'm filtering. So this win tweet will contain uh, only tweets which are uh, only rows which has which which are tweets from Google. Right? But this will contain all the rows, all the all the columns. So it's the entire thing, all, all the columns will be there. And from there, I'm I'm doing one more generate where I'm this is to just get only the tweet text, not the entire. I'm just getting only the columns. Okay. I could have probably done it in one single statement, but I just split it up to many So this was just to demonstrate the idea, right? Because otherwise we could have simply done filter by dollar six equals uh, contains. And so I wanted to do a UDF which is complete, I mean, not trivial, really, but at the same time something which is of some use to me, rather just becoming So this will give me print out all the tweets, only the tweets uh, which I did from the VA. So every uh, so every line is a slightly cut off. This is this clear now? So this is one line. This is one line. This is one line like that. Okay. So you get uh, the list of tweets. Uh, so are you able to find a problem in this? I saw this problem only today morning, so I did testify. But are you able to find a problem? In this? Yeah, that's the okay. But it's not coming at all. Because sometimes it's going to be very interesting. See the line, it's so complicated. What is it? Which one? The last one. It's so complicated. After that, it's simple. It's very interesting. Passing some of the Java is such a pain. I don't know why it is so complicated. Lockdown. Yeah. What's the middle of the? You're right there. Go up a little bit. There. There's a tool coming there as well. Yeah. So this is so this is so this is my this oh this is, is your uh, this smiley is okay. this is the tree okay this is just the top tuple which is coming so that's yeah. that, that's not the problem which I was talking is it so can you can you can you say what what do I say that there is a problem with the way this where the big tweets have been uh, passed no the way the tweets are displayed I realized it only today morning. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Can you see this tweet? Yeah. What is missing? The end code? No. Actually what happened was, these are tweets which have comma in them. Okay. So they got truncated. Okay. So this tweet actually had some more text in it, but it was comma separated. But in my peak loader, I was using comma as a delimiter. 
So this got split into multiple. Yeah, so how do I escape that? That UDF. I so you can use a UDF in, uh, in the load to split that. Okay. But I think there should be some way to do this. And even I am trying to find a solution because I realized it when it could be. Okay. And I was just like seeing running these samples again. I realized. It. So I didn't have time to look for the solution, but I need to find a solution. So this uh, is a problem we've been solving in Infinity for a while. The reader and writer. We have our own UDS for both. And also it varies depending on what uh, your source and target is. Let's say you're going from a Oracle versus uh, MySQL versus something else. Into the Hadoop cluster, into the works that you're doing. We will do something like that. Yeah. So the, uh, I mean, the, the thing which came to my mind first was just to use a loader function. I mean, accept the loader and then use it. But I think this is a pretty common problem too. There should be some way in which to solve this. Why couldn't you use the text loader that they have and then go for that? We could, we could use that. I mean, no, text loader for this we can't use, right? Because this it, is. It basically uh, tokenizes the words the text. Text loader is for tokenizing words. This is CSV file. Everything is like a <coughs> like no. Okay. It's a tweet file, right? So which had something like 10 or 15 columns and everything is separated. Could be some way to treat the double quotes as a special character. Yeah, so some either we should write a custom logic or there should be some way. I have not figured that out. That, that is something. Okay, yeah, good CSV parser usually has options for that. Yeah, or maybe there is a CSV loader. There is a CSV loader for it, which we should. Is, is this problem coming because you, from the first line, uh, sort of, uh, as uh, load, you know, the file? This is because of this. <coughs> oh. I'm using a commas to dig in. Now, I, I didn't realize that when I wrote the function. I was just like rerunning all the examples today morning just to check, verify everything. And then, I suddenly signed me that. Uh, Functions, 
So, so the tissue that's given to the uh, UDF, that is uh, usually for one row or is it for all one rows? One row. It is coming. It is all the columns in that one row from the previous data set that's given to the UDF. Yes. And therefore, it, it could be it could be all the all the columns, or it could be just the one column which you have passed. Right. Depending on. Depending on what you have passed. Uh, so that is the first thing. So if there is any error which would affect, uh, which would affect only that row, then you should return that. But if there are, if the error affects uh, other rows as well, but you can recover from it, okay, then you should throw an I/O exception. Okay. So examples of this is, uh, let's say you are uh, using some config file in a UDF, you're trying to read that one. You can't read it for some reason. So any data which comes to that particular node, or any uh, data which comes to the partic that particular node will fail. But others might. Those are scenarios. So there, you should throw an I/O exception. But there are other scenarios where you can't do anything, and you may or may not know that things will work out. Right? So those scenarios, you should also throw an I/O exception. But what happens in this case is. If the I/O exception is thrown beyond a threshold, or if the exception, right, the normal exception, if that is thrown beyond an exception, then the entire job might fail. Others will fail the entire job. How do you set the threshold as low as you want? That I think you have to do it in your job. So that doesn't come with Peak. If this is, as, I mean, this is the same for both Peak and Peak. So even if your map reduce, so is keep on throwing an error, right? We want a uh, threshold it will, it will kill the entire job. So the job config is created by big, right? Yes. So you can also configure it, you can have global configuration for the job. At your job. So Hadoop has this master cluster and then the job yes, it's called Zookeeper. So this job task man task manager for you there and so So the so these two things are the main things, right? So if you feel that the problem is only with that particular row, then it's always better to return that. Okay. But if it's if it if it could be a problem with other rows, then you throw an I/O exception. Okay. 